Yeah. I'd like to welcome everybody tonight to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim. I'll be moderating along with Andy Anderson tonight. And uh, the College of Complexes consists of the following format. First, we have a brief announcements period. Then our speaker will speak. Then we will have our question and answer period where we're encouraged to ask questions and not make a speech because after the question and answer period you have a chance to rebut and speak your mind generally at the four minutes each. All right. All right, I'll do it. All right, I'm sorry I have not had the opportunity to personally interview the gentleman to my left, Jesse. Or you go by Jay. And I'll allow him the opportunity to give you his own bio, a little bit of the background. Uh, we originally had Stanfield Smith scheduled. Uh, he's spoken several times on Central and South American issues, um, but he was unable to make it. So uh, for his recommendation, uh, we invited the uh, Honduras organization here. And you can tell us about some background on that and maybe bring us up to date on this, uh, this entire immigration issue, uh, which has most assuredly been in the news. So thank you very much, sir. And there's our speaker. Yay! Thank you, everyone. Um, my name is Jesse Chewy Chavez. Everyone calls me Chewy. Um, <clears throat> I'm born on the south side, uh, Sox fan, sorry. <laughs> um, to undocumented parents, uh, so uh, the issue of immigration is, is close to me. Um, I am a member of La Voz de los Abajo. Um, we are the voice of those from below. We're an organization that's been working mainly in Honduras, also in Mexico, uh, since Hurricane Mitch. I don't know if you remember Hurricane Mitch, completely devastated Honduras. Um, uh, almost two decades ago. And uh, we've been going down there, doing delegations, um, helping support not just through you know, financial support or, uh, or charity aid, but also finding organizations that were seeking their own self-determination, their own way of confronting this crisis, because the government wasn't stepping in to, to assist the poorest communities, and helping those organizations in whatever way we could. Um, with that work back and forth in Honduras, we, uh, let's just give you a little background, um, we're going back and forth, we're, we're supporting a country that, uh, unlike El Salvador or Guatemala, did not experience directly a civil war in the 80s. Um, unfortunately, Honduras was in the back pocket of the United States military policy, so the base, the, the bases that are out there, um, the government were completely in line with um, uh, supporting against the guerrilla movements in the 80s. So no one really paid attention to Honduras the way they paid attention to what was going on in El Salvador and Guatemala and Nicaragua. Uh, and there was a lot of uh, need, right? And for supporting organizations, uh, campesino organizations, student organizations, labor organizations, teacher organizations, etc. cetera. Um, and we saw them organizing. Um, it was very interesting because um, and I'll, I'll, I'll go into a little bit, but uh, every, Honduras is a small country. It's only seven million people. So think Chicago metro area, right? Uh, but they still are very rich in um, a cross section of society. There's an urban, urban center. There's campesino organizations. There's an entire Afro Honduran community. Uh, there's an indigenous community, various indigenous communities, right? Um, and so. There was many issues to organize in each of those sectors. LGBT community, right, makes sense. Uh, liberation theology it still holds very strong in Honduras and several churches. So those organizations were organizing, trying to form a national movement to institute change. Um, and come 2009, they actually find in all of a sudden, they find themselves with a president who is willing to listen to the movement. So this president came from one of the elite parties, one of the elite families. There's about seven elite families in Honduras that control the majority of the land, the resources, the economy. Um, but this president all of a sudden starts listening to them. He 
proposes to start considering joining the ALBA movement, the Pink Tide, Venezuela, and Brazil, and everyone else in, in that South American sector. Uh, and he proposes to start looking at constitutional changes to uh, including the, the previous constitution was written in the 80s when the US still had military domain over Honduras. So it didn't include rights for women, rights for indigenous, rights to land, etc. Uh, the way the people want. So they, he proposed a constituent assembly, uh, which uh, to draft a new constitution that was inclusive of all of these different sectors. Well, as you can imagine, that completely pissed off the elite, right? Uh, especially with the strength of Venezuela, with the strength of Brazil, with Bolivia, and uh, a real possibility of, an, of a more northern change, all the way up in, in Central America. And with U.S. support, including then Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, who wrote in her book how she uh, supported the folks who instituted this coup. They executed a coup. So they picked up President Zelaya at the time, uh, in the middle of the night in 2009, pick him up, put him on a plane, yeah. drop him off in another country in his pajamas, right? And forbid him from coming back. Meanwhile, one of the elites, Micheletti, uh, appoints himself interim president. Uh, there's a, a long process of uh, them trying to formalize the coup, justify the coup, but everyone in Latin America knew this is a coup, right? 2009, we're still experiencing uh, a military coup. Um, so then what happens is uh, all those sectors that were organizing, you know, they were quietly organizing for about eight years, they, they, they tell us, right, before, um, you know, and this is Trotskyists and uh, anarchists and women in the resistance and feminists in the resistance, which for some reason are two different groups, and youth and LGBT and just a plethora of different groups <coughs> form the National Resistance Front. And all of a sudden our work, which was to support the movements down there, became focused on this National Front because that's where all the movements joined together to say we, we resist this coup, we resist this imposition uh, this break in democracy, this imposition of, uh, of a candidate that was never elected, right? Of a president that was never elected, right? So I, I started taking my first delegations here from Chicago because I was supporting from here, but I, I had not had a chance to go down there. And for me, just to share a personal anecdote, it's really interesting as someone who's been active in many solidarity movements uh, and in my own home country, uh, Mexico, with. Uh, the Zapatista movement, to be able to walk into, you know, post-coup, go down in Honduras, sit in a room, you know, a little bit larger than this, and have a representative from every sector of society trying to make joint decisions on, on their resistance, right? Uh, that they're going to, what is the next step? Is it, when's the next march? When is the next um, you know, campaign, etc. that we're going to execute uh, to stop the, the coup, right? Uh, this is in the face of repression, unbelievable repression. Uh, some sectors were disproportionately affected. For example, the LGBT move, movement lost the, the sector of LGBT. The sector of the LGBT sector of the population actually disproportionately had more assassinations than any other in the first so many days of the movement. Right? It, it was incredible how the military uh, and the government. You know, pretty much aim their targets at, at stopping the LGBT movement, right? Um, so um, between human rights defenders that had been still campaigning for uh, the disappeared and political prisoners from the 80s, um, to several other networks, uh, solidarity networks, uh, joined together to help uh, create more delegations, to issue international proclamations. We would stop at the US Embassy and say, this is our testimony, this is what we saw when we went into this community. They told us about this person being killed, or that person being affected, or the military coming in and burning down these houses, or the military coming in and shutting down this radio station. And we would register all those with the US Embassy, and knowing full well that they were, you know, you know common language, in cahoots, right, with what was going on. But we at least wanted it on record, right? Uh, as far as um, documenting what was going on. And on our site, Honduras Resists, we have every delegation that has gone since then, and all the reports of this. Everything from going into a small collective of women who are raising potatoes and corn for their families, 
uh, you know, as I said, to Afro Honduran radio stations, which broadcast in Spanish, uh, in their language, as well as in English, right? And to come to com other campesino movements, to student movements who have all lost people, both uh, disappeared, uh, executed, assassinated, um, or uh, jailed. So with us, we continue up the pressure. Uh, several organizations that were working on Honduras formed a Honduras Solidarity Network, and so I invite you to search that on uh, your favorite search engine and make sure that uh, you subscribe to the blog updates because we have several actions that are continuing uh, to support Honduras. Right. Um, with that, there's two further elections that have taken place uh, which are trying to normalize, we call it normalizing the coup, because in reality, uh, both elections uh, were in favor of the existing parties in power, and the opposition parties were defrauded in multiple cases. The most famous one being this, just this last election, where uh, it takes place on a Sunday in Honduras, everything is shut down, uh, everything is closed, uh, there's no liquor sales, etc. They, um, everyone goes votes on a Sunday. On Sunday night, they start tallying, and the opposition, the Libre Party candidate, the Alianza candidate, uh, is winning by over five percentage points. Suddenly, there's a computer glitch. Come Monday morning, midday, they start they start the election tallying process again, and the, ex uh, the existing party candidate is winning, and the opposition candidate is losing. And eventually, they declare a loss. There's all kinds of uh, steps taken with the Organization of American States and filing of complaints. But uh, once Trump, the U.S. president, and a few others started. Uh, accepting the existing president's uh, role, uh, they inaugurate him and so he becomes uh, president, again, by fraud. Right? So the opposition has had not had luck as a resistance movement nor as a electoral movement in order to change the conditions of the coup. So we say it's not that democracy has returned, right? It's that the coup has continued in a different form. Um, the seven families still have the majority of the resources, uh, agrarian law, labor law has been overturned. Uh, there's a new security law which criminalizes protests. So you have currently in Honduras several political prisoners. Uh, we consider them political prisoners because they were protesting after the election and they were arrested for protesting, for voicing their concerns. So we, uh, the Honduras Solidarity Network currently has uh, a large um, campaign going on to support those political prisoners. Uh, and believe me, I mean, I know we always say writing a letter to the congressman or your local representative uh, is, is a way of taking action. It does make sense uh, for Honduras because um, we were able once with enough pressure, uh, led by, for example, um, Jan Schakowsky, uh, is to temporarily pause the military aid to Honduras. And that scares them. That scares them when, when we actually are able to have enough of a force to, to stop the military aid that sustains their continued repression against activists um, because we shine a light on, on everything that that aid is being used for. So um, transitioning a little bit into the current migrant situation and the immigrant immigration situation, uh, I have just a couple of figures to, to numbers to share because you know we see it in the news um, and we want to know what's particularly different that it's, it's being um, emphasized now. Sorry, I'm locking this thing. So, Honduras in and of itself, as I mentioned, before 2009, before the coup, was subjugated, obedient, the government in line with US military policy, the Washington Doctrine, et cetera, if you want to call it. Uh, CAFTA, free trade, everything that IMF says. Uh, President Zelaya proposes to, to change that formula, to join ALBA, and we have the coup. After the coup, the regime really settled into power and the neoliberal agenda continues. Uh, privatization, anti-terrorism, drug wars, narco gobierno Even the Carnegie Endowment wrote a paper where it called uh, Corruption as an Operating System. Uh, the Honduran government is one of the most corrupt, and I come from Mexico, <laughs> which is just as corrupt, right? But the Honduran government is one of the most, most corrupt uh, systems in place where even the former president's brother was indicted as part of the uh, as part of the cartel transferring drugs right um, the same neoliberal policies in place Canadian mining companies hydroelectric companies uh, 
taking over, um, attempting to take over land to use for projects which benefit private There's even this idea, you've heard of charter schools, right? There's even this idea of a charter city, an entire city with uh, privatized laws, police force, et cetera, water, et cetera. Right? They call it a model city, right? But it's a charter city in effect. Uh, so much so that there's millionaires out there who are like, yes, this would be great, and somewhere in beautiful Honduras, there'll be this beautiful city with everything privatized, right? Uh, unfortunately, I mean, as we come to find out, the former president's brother uh, is one of the investors, so there's family money in play as far as uh, obtaining the land, and the land is going to be sold to these model cities. Some of the land belongs to the Afro-Honduran community, which they have not been told about. These model cities will be taking over their land, right? Um, so it, it's a continuous struggle to resist these type of ideas um, in Honduras. Um, now, post this coup and post these additional electoral uh, coups, right, defrauding, defrauding the opposition movement, Honduras has dropped to one of the, uh, well, raised, or I would say dropped to one of the top levels of social inequality in terms of the dichotomy between the rich and the poor. Uh, it's one of the top three in the world. Right? That's, that's how different it is uh, for an campesino living in Honduras to one of the elite okay. families. The only other ones are Haiti and Haiti in South Africa, right, as of last year. Um, in addition, going into this, again, transitioning back to migration, uh, you've seen an uptick since the coup where uh, Honduras has become one of the top three most dangerous countries to live in in the world in terms of homicides. Also, the rate at which Honduran children have migrated to the United States has exceeded that of Mexico. Now, Mexico is a country with uh, almost 100 million people south of the border. Do a battery change. has increased uh, tremendously. The destabilization, the repression. Um, again, uh, when the majority of the people have voted for a candidate and the elites and the military have defrauded them right, of, of their vote, people feel scared. When a security law comes in that says that uh, you are criminalized if you protest those circumstances, people become scared. We have seen um, since 2009 uh, the index indices for homicide increase. And I was mentioning before the tape ended, um, for the first time ever, the number of children who have migrated out of Honduras to the United States has exceeded that of the number of children even making them. So, which is much closer, etc. So, that that increase is a result of the lack of opportunities, etc. The militarization, this whole backdrop that I've kind of uh, laid out about the situation. In the world. Um, so, if you look at that northern triangle that they talk about, uh, if we look at it concretely, you're talking about Honduras, which is fourth in world for murder, sorry, it's the top three. It's the fourth one in world murder rate. Well, Salvador is actually the first, and Guatemala is the fifth. So that kind of uh, insecurity in society. And looking back at the origins, I just talked about Honduras. We can have a whole other conversation about uh, the birth of the Maras in El Salvador, going back to the US-funded Contras in Nicaragua, um, the, the military apparatus that was set up in the 80s that devolved into the drug war and, uh, and the ongoing violence there. So you have uh, Mexico, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras contributing to this migration through the insecurities. Um, you have the increased rate of children coming from El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, succeeding from even those from Mexico. Uh, and you're actually looking at now, in the last, 2014 to 2016, so this is not too far back, 26,000 children deaths in migration, right? 26,000 lost children migrating from 
uh, the Northern Triangle and Mexico over to uh, the United States. There's 12 million children seeking asylum last year alone, right, that are outside their country. Uh, in 2017, 48% of all international migrants were actually women. Um, and this, this, you know, these figures, you can continue to look at, at them. These are all uh, pretty recent, 2017, like last year. Uh, and we have 15,000 unaccompanied children now. Right? So, Aside from fleeing violence and, and trying to rejoin with family or, or families trying to get them out of the insecure situation uh, towards the United States, um, aside from death, just literally death at trying to make the, 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 the route, um, there's also the risk of entering into child slavery, uh, sexual uh, abuse networks, Organ donation network, or, you know, illegal organ transplant donation networks, etc. They happen with uh, the children who are often missing. Just for an example, we have a compañero from our organization who works with uh, unaccompanied minors here, right? And when they get here, or we they're tracked down, you have to really make sure that you don't turn them over to someone who says they're a relative, but they're not really relatives. Right? They might be using them for something illegal. Uh, the kids themselves might not know. So there's a lot that goes into making sure that these um, children are, are safe. Um, and as we saw, the cages and the pictures, right, and the kids having to defend themselves in, in court uh, without understanding the process that they're going through. Uh, and I would dare say, especially being a progressive crowd here, that this is not new necessarily to Trump. The family detention program actually started under Obama several years ago. So these cages did not just come up last week, right, or in the last few months. So um, this has been something that, you know, no matter who's in power, it's an issue that we have to challenge. Right? So um, some of the organizations that we work with, going on Honduras, um, in order to make that change, in order to create uh, a stable government society. Um, supporting the resistance against this military rule or this pseudo-military rule and, and uh, the security apparatus uh, is the CNTC, which are the Campesino organization. So they're the ones who fight for agrarian reform. Um, there's cases, for example, uh, Dole Pineapple was given a 99-year lease to grow pine uh, pineapples or bananas in Honduras, right, uh, on land. That 99 year lease ended several years ago. Um, and what do they do? They actually get a subsidiary of Dole in Honduras with an Honduran name to actually reclaim the same land that Dole had. Instead of returning it back for use by the, by the campesinos, uh, Dole tries to keep it in power by, and in one notorious case, they actually had like their head like bodyguard, who happens to be Honduran, <laughs> sign on as the president of the subsidiary, and that's who Dole was selling the, uh, you know, giving back the land to, right? <laughs> Another Honduran, uh, according to the law, but it was still in Dole's hands. Right? So there's this huge amount of land there. Legally, the Honduran people are entitled to that land and distribution of that land. So the CNTC um, goes, forms a committee of people that want to take part of that land. They go, they form their tents, uh, they start claiming the land, and they don't go in willy-nilly. They have an army of lawyers who understand the grand reform law, make the case, file it in court, and then the process is to continue, right? Well, those court cases, the government will the delay and delay and delay and delay, and there's some where people are waiting for 20 years, 25 years, to resolve those grand reform cases. Meanwhile, Dole hires a security firm, and they come in, and they cause trouble, and then the army comes in, and they start bringing in the bulldozers and raising people's houses. They could have been there a week or they could have been there for years. Uh, whenever, um, not only Dole, but also the Honduran rich elite landowners, the Facuse family, which is associated with like Mazzola Oil um, and several other projects, will you know, hire these private security firms to come in. And basically they're police and soldiers who work on the, on the side and they'll come in and uh, everything from harassing to burning down their, their tents or their houses to uh, assassin, outright cold assassinations. We've seen 
the rate of assassinations. Uh, last year we were reporting almost one a week on our blog, just from different camps where people were trying to scare, you know, uh, the security firms were coming in trying to scare uh, the campesinos out of fighting for their land. Um, the most famous case, uh, if you happen to hear it in the news, was the case of Berta Caceres, an indigenous Lenca uh, environmental activist. She has actually uh, was awarded the Goldman Prize for her work with her community for defending um, their river, which is a sacred river in their community, against the hydroelectric project that was being imposed by a foreign company. They fought and fought and fought. Um, she won the prize. A, a lot of attention was paid to the river. And there was a discovery of a hit list uh, that some soldier left behind. And she was the number one name on it. So she knew her life was in danger, but she continued to fight. Uh, against the uh, tank takeover of that river for this private electric pro uh, hydroelectric project. Uh, and, uh, and in the middle of the night, uh, she was assassinated in her home. Um, we say, you know, Berta no murió, Berta se multiplicó. Berta was such a force of nature, such a, a strong uh, woman, strong environmental activist, strong anti capitalist, someone who, um, strong indigenous. Celebrator of indigenous culture, um, she, you know, she didn't die; she multiplied because uh, so many have taken her cause, uh, her from her daughters on to every other movement, to uh, to take her example of continuing to fight even in the face of adversity for what's right. So there's actually a Berta Caceres law that is making the rounds in Congress right now, again to quote, and this is what I'm saying. Calling your congressman, representative, etc., following the campaigns on the Honduras Solidarity Network site, because um, uh, we want to hold those responsible who uh, not just who pulled the trigger, but the intellectual authors, right? The military, the government, the private companies which are targeting environmental activists uh, for assassination. Honduras, in itself, itself has had 69 journalists killed. Um, since 2001, so um, 123 land and environmental defenders um, in the last decade also. So 123 people killed for being environmentalists, right, for defending the land. Um, there is no guarantee of rights for trade unions. So the stripping away of union rights uh, is continued under the current government. So that's the backdrop of Honduras. That's a little bit of an explanation of uh, why some of the migration is happening here. Uh, of course, you can you know, pay attention to the news and the actual conditions that folks are, are the, the youth and, and the families are being held with here. Um, but many times we don't look at the explanations, right? We just kind of concentrate on the surface issues. Um, but when we look at the cause, and we see the U.S. role in the Civil War in El Salvador, the U.S. role in Guatemala, the U.S. role in Nicaragua, the U.S. role in Honduras. We see that the same military um, initiatives, which are supposedly called for security, are actually creating insecurity, maintaining the status quo for the elite, and causing this migration uh, of people who are fleeing basically for their safety, right? and being refused uh, asylum here um, by now this government. So that's a little bit of the situation. Uh, on the hopeful side, uh, please follow the Honduras Solidarity Network website because we do have a campaign to support political prisoners. We've been able to free political prisoners through sustained pressure. So uh, sometimes activism, you know, we, 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 we really know the causes are unjust and you know, we don't want to give up hope because we know if we continue putting the pressure on it, uh, we'll find that crack in order to make you know the outcome that we want. And we've been able to free political prisoners before with continued pressure, uh, and we, there's a whole slew of political prisoners, prisoners that we want to free now. Uh, in addition, continuing to shine this light, especially now that the issue is in the news, you know, so that people don't say, well, why are all those people coming here and taking their jobs, right? Well, you know, why did we go over there and send a bunch of tanks and helicopters and uh, you know sustain uh, a some of the most highest levels of inequality that exists on this planet. So thank you very much, and please feel free to ask questions. All right. Kurt, right. the first one I'd like to ask you is how did you get, tell us a little bit about yourself, 
why you got involved with the Honduras and then specifically why this organization? Uh, sure, so just um, personal background. Um, I, uh, since high school and, and out to college, have uh, been just part of many different activism organizations. Um, in 1994, when the Zapatistas uh, uh, first rose up in Mexico, uh, I became very involved with, with them and with other Latin American issues. Um, and but really, uh, Honduras specifically, always an ongoing supporter, but really getting into Honduras and into La Voz de los Abajo was the coup, because um, you know, we really saw that Latin America was starting to shift to a more progressive politics and, and hope against the Washington Doctrine, against the imposition of neoliberal uh, policies. And Honduras is kind of where the US decided, right? Like, that's it, we're, not, we're gonna start turning it back. And so I think it was really a flashpoint. Uh, the other thing for me is uh, going to Honduras for this first time. And, and like I said, you know, we, out here we can go to any protest and you'll see you know, the RCP, the CP, the ISO, and you'll see everyone with their newspapers and everyone arguing with each other, right? And we were able to go into Honduras and you know, every day we're hitting one or two different stops. So we'll hit the Trotsky, it's an anarchist, and we'll stop at the church and sleep overnight with the liberation theologists. And then we'll move over to the women's collective, and then we'll go to the farmers, and then we'll go to the students. And almost every single place, as many differences as everyone had, they had a singular goal. And it, it just, it was something beautiful to see um, how people, you know, there was still tension, believe me, everybody had their differences and had different proposals, but um, they could come together as a national front uh, for what was most important. So uh, La Voz uh, here had so many great people, and uh, I was glad to be a part of this particular movement. Um, and also seeing all the different influences in Honduras of uh, you know, Zapatismo, in the campesino communities, uh, students debating, um, all kinds of topics, radio stations, radio stations, which I, you know, it doesn't make a lot of sense to us here <laughs> all the time to have um, a public radio that's really progressive and really in depth. But, you know, I went to every single town that we would go to, and we would have, there would be a, a small little community radio station talking about the issues, right? And when do you just have a morning conversation and it's like, okay, the women's issues of the day, uh, whether it's abortion or health, access to health care, or et cetera. And every day uh, a woman was on and they were doing interviewing and having a show and then they would have little clips throughout the day about the different issues reminding people. Right. Or where would you go and hear a Catholic church radio station, a progressive Catholic church radio station, talking about supporting sexual diversity, right? And not discriminating against people based on their sexual orientation, right? Very carefully coded, right? To be in line with, you know, um, to not deviate, uh, not get, I guess, uh, chastised by the church, but very, very clear message that sexual diversity uh, and support for uh, everyone's different orientations, right? So just seeing that level of progressivism in the middle of a resistance movement totally just inspired me to um, continue working and doing everything I can. Because people would say, like, uh, well, we're going to Honduras to support, right? Because you know there's so much need there. If anything, I felt Honduras was supporting me in my uh, journey and trying to make change in the world. Because they were facing tear gas and bullets and you know, all kinds of repression, and they did not, they were not fearful at all. They knew what was right, and they fought for it. So one of the biggest chants was, uh, nos tienen miedo porque no tenemos miedo. We, they, they're fearful of us because we no longer have fear, right? So they fear us because we no longer have fear. And I was like, wow. <laughs> yes. Okay, who's next? Uh, all right, that was next. Yeah, um, this isn't about Honduras, it's about Nicaragua. Like Daniel Ortega, he said it's become like the other dictators in Nicaragua. But I don't get much news about it, so I don't know what's happening there. Do you have any idea? Um, probably not as informed as I should be to speak to it. Uh, there's definitely, over the years, been, there's been many different sides and tendencies within Nicaragua, but the recent events specifically have uh, been painted. Yes, you should. I, I don't want to make a comment. Okay. Um, I'm with you that uh, the situation in, Nicar Nicarag uh, in Honduras 
was what really, uh, not that I would have, not that I would have voted Democratic anyway, but it was definitely a turning point as far as I'm concerned that, uh, in understanding the position of the United States in Latin America. And I was really dismayed to see, is it Zelaya who was the lava loss? Uh, yeah, I was really dismayed to see him uh, taken out of office by basically the United States. And uh, so I, I really understand that. Here in Chicago, the Eighth Day Center for Justice is closing, and or has closed. I'm not sure whether it has closed or is closing. And I heard a rumor that this was caused by the uh, by the uh, attitude of the Eighth Day Center versus the uh, Roman Catholic Church, and that the church was getting tired of um, having the Eighth Day Center take positions that it was taking, and they closed them down. So I, I, I don't know whether that's true, and I'm wondering if you have any information about that situation. I, I think I'm more in your camp. I've heard that it's closing, and I've heard there could be those reasons, but I don't know for sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And there is such a great resource to so many of us. Yeah. Uh, I think that was next. Well, do, don't you think it's common sense for Americans to begin against all these refugees coming in with their disease, with their drugs, with their homicides, killing their mayors? I mean, well, why can't you people come in legally? Don't respond. Yeah, I don't know how to respond hey, to that. Don't respond. Yeah, I don't know how to respond to framing it that way. Uh, and I'm sure we can. You guys can get into the debate <laughs> later on. We will. Um, if it leaves early, you better respond to it now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, we definitely. You know, the, I, I don't want to say that we want to paint everyone have this broad stroke that paints everyone as. You know, immigrants, you know, good light or in a bad light, right? We don't want to say, hey, there's this good immigrant that we should allow in, this bad immigrant that we shouldn't allow in, right? Um, as I mentioned, most of the reasons for this are people fleeing for their own safety um, caused by U.S. intervention and policy. So um, I think when people want to uh, protect their kids, I, uh, it, I don't think it matters what, what border they have to cross or where they have to go. Uh, they're just like me and you, we would protect our families and offer them an opportunity um, and I don't think it's about diseases or murders or any of that. Uh, here, here. Here, here. Yes. Um, the two biggest countries that, that have uh, countries that immigrate to the United States by far are uh, the most uh, immigrants coming are uh, India and China. Uh, oh, Mexico is okay. far down the third. But anyway, do you see, um, has there been an increase from Honduras, Guatemala uh, uh, over the last 10 years over the of last, uh, immigration? Yes. And then my uh, second question is, would Honduras be better off if there were more lawyers and courts to get a handle on all the corruption? Um, so the first question is, yes. you know, is there an increase? Definitely an increase, yes, particularly in the children fleeing um, since 2009. Um, and I say fleeing, right? It's a forced migration, we call it. Um, and then the other case is the lawyers, uh, for example, the lead lawyer for the teachers union was uh, living in hiding the last time I was down there, right? So even if you are a lawyer trying to make change, you have death threats against you. Uh, same thing with the lawyers for the campesinos trying to uh, enact the uh, reform cases. So uh, I don't know. If, I think it's more the security situation uh, and the security law, which in effect targets, you know, that creates this environment of repression that is more of an issue rather than not having the lawyers themselves. So the lawyers are being more secure, more lawyers and courts, and more policing, just a better legal system. Well, um, top to bottom. Police, uh, no, Honduras. Yeah, uh, oh, no, the, uh, I think the repressive, the police are the repression right now. 
right? Yeah. So I don't know if we need necessarily more police, but how Not do we? Not police, yeah. legal system. Legal system, yeah. yeah. A legal, legal system legal, where robust legal system. Which you know the the law is there and the cases are there, but as uh, as I mentioned that paper from the Carnegie Endowment, uh, corruption is the operating system, right? Yeah. So how do you end corruption when you have you know unlimited U.S. funds for military aid you know, supporting uh, the you know corruption, right? What do you have uh, or when you have narco states in a sense, right? Where you don't you can't distinguish between the politician and the narco cartel in Honduras or in Mexico, et cetera, because they're one and the same. In Mexico, in the, uh, there was a recent figure of about, of about $8 billion being transferred in bribes from cartels to politicians. Right? You can't be a politician if you're not li literally in bed right, with the cartel. So, right? so the, the continuation of the drug war, which says, let's send more money, let's send you know, more more military aid, let's send more money to the government, really is propping up this repressive apparatus as opposed to actually ending the drug war. Because where are we, what year are we in the drug war? And it's only getting worse. Um, I know it takes a long time to um, be able to enter uh, legally. Uh, I talked to a Filipino several years ago, it took him 12 years. Is, is that the main reason why people from South America don't uh, pursue the legal route. Um, you know, go to the uh, U.S. Uh, embassy. I don't know what they are supposed to do in these other countries to apply. Is, is that why they don't do that? Hmm. I mean, so these have been problems in uh, the Triangle countries right. for many years. So, so I mean, there, there. That is not the primary reason, right? I mean, there is a. There is a long process, and uh, I know friends who work on the technical side of the immigration system, and you know, there's more paper than computers, right? <laughs> like it's just a very long, dreaded process to actually make any progress there. Um, but I think the bigger situation is um, support for asylum seekers. So Trump just ended the support for Central Americans who are seeking asylum, right? And basically canceled their right to stay here. So because he doesn't consider their need for asylum. So I think if you don't have a route to apply through for asylum to be able to get here, you're going to do something else because the situation's still there. But it's been there Whether for the so US, many years, you know. Uh, particularly increased in, since 2009, yeah. And, and then do these other countries in South America, are they trying to help the people in the Triangle countries, especially? Um, in terms of asylum, and the United Nations. Interesting. Um, yeah, that's a good question. I'm not sure of the different role that has been played. Um, depending, like I said, uh, if there are countries that support the economic model that creates inequality and creates a situation for migrants or forced migration, um, and that has not been helpful. Right? So. For you know the conservative right-wing governments to go out and support um, the electoral winner who won by fraud and continuation of those policies and the privatization of the resources and the exasperation of the inequality, you're going to continue to make more forced migration. It would be actually creating an alternative economic model where whether Venezuela or Bolivia or other countries can work can actually influence Honduras and El Salvador and Nicaragua and Guatemala to create an economic model that is more equitable, where people actually have an opportunity, that would be the bigger challenge. That doesn't exist. That's, That's what Celaya was trying to do when he was taken out of his uh, presidential palace in his pajamas and thrown into another country. What are the main products that are on the And I, I realize that if you have the very, very wealthy, they are dependent on the people that work for them. And I was just wondering, is unionization of labor a force that would overthrow the most powerful rich? Yeah, that, particularly the teachers, and, and I, used to, I used to teach for a while. Um, and just like here in the United States, we have this wave of teacher activism going on and teacher strikes. The teachers were a very strong labor movement um, that was challenging the privatization of uh, the modern education system. Like I said, privatization is, is on a rampage in Honduras, right? 
uh, across Austin people. Um, but then, I guess the lawyers and the president of the teachers movement had to live in hiding because they were on the assassination list. Right? So if those are the conditions under which labor would have to take act, take action, right? Where they're, you can take action, but then you're also on this target list. So it's a very, very slippery situation. Yes, labor, right? of course, could be, a, could be a force for that. But that's exactly why they're being targeted, because they could be that force. What are the products? And then on the product side, on the economy side, I mean, there is a whole uh, maquila sector. You know, you have shirts made in Honduras, clothing, textiles, et cetera. Um, it's a little sad. I'm gonna say it's a little sad for environmentalists. Um, there's this whole wave of, and this is this is this World Bank initiative. Um, you know, let's let's go into these poor countries and help them produce green products, right? And when they produce green products, you know, we're going to save the environment and create a better economic situation for these countries. Well, it's false because it's not a better, the, the people who latch on to that green product movement, in this case, it's palm oil uh, as an alternative to other oils, um, which is not necessarily green because the African palms that are imported and these huge monoculture farms of an African palm destroy the soil and nothing else can grow in it afterwards. But they're under the guise of a World Bank green product, you know, sustainable economy kind of program, well, it's, the landowners are still the same landowners. It didn't create any equity for, for the, the poor. So it's the Fakuse family, which is the largest landowner in Honduras. It's other families which are latching on and getting this World Bank money for these projects. Other workers have to work for them and end up in the same situation as they were before. It's, it's, it's very sad. Venezuela was the richest country in Latin America. What happened to it? Now it's on decline. Price of oil. I'm gonna. I, know <laughs> I, I was actually calling on him first because he had his book yet. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to ask: uh, have, uh, have there been uh, threats against uh, Honduran activists in the United States? Oh, uh, we actually have. There are an activist who moves with his family here to the United States um, because of threats. I didn't know to what extent the threat exists here or not, other than the risk of being deported and facing the consequences over there. So no, not that I've actually seen. It's not like like the Russians or something, right? Who go out into other countries and assassinate. I haven't seen that necessarily here. In my experience, it could be the case. Sorry, uh, he was a. Major U.S. corporations are, have their interests there. Um, so, I guess that's Zola through the Fakusev family. Um, yeah, his, their corporation is called the Dina Corporation, which is Mazzola and a few other uh, products. Um, the Canadian mining companies, Canadian hydroelectric companies, Canadians, as liberal as they seem, their mining companies are terrible in mining. Um, so, I really think there's actually a movement uh, on the network in uh, the Honduras Salary Network in Canada to try to stop those companies uh, going to shareholder meetings and uh, advocate against these projects because they're causing death and destruction of the, not only of the land but assassinations of the people who defend it. You were going to ask about Venezuela? I asked about the, why did Venezuela fall like this? They were the richest country in Latin America and now they're in, what was it, 500% uh, inflation rate? I'm not an expert on Venezuela. I haven't visited, so I don't know that I could speak to it other than just the continued, uh, uh, I guess, that U.S. policy in the region has been to you know, squash anything that opposes it. That's not the answer. You're done, buddy. That's not the answer. My turn. All right. Um, I'm getting figures here that there are 2,300, now it's... It's over 3,000, and then they say there's records of something like 12,000 children uh, have been taken by their parents. Given that this community is about the size of Chicago, that must be fairly devastating to some of the people. I mean, that, that doesn't affect like many, many families? Or, I mean, yes, yes, yes. They impact it. There is no, um, yeah, it's not, it, it affects every sector of Honduran society. Um, particularly in areas where Hondurans have migrated, New Orleans, New York, et cetera. Um, those are the communities where they feel the pinch of the missing children the most. 
I can't speak to it other than, you know, you can't put together why uh, the specific policy. I, I, it would be interesting. Um, one of the architects within the administration of uh, the immigration policy goes back to very racist roots in the 90s. Um, Federation of American Immigration Reform and some of the other groups that have operated within that kind of far right sector, intersecting with David Duke, intersecting with um, the folks who met at Echo Park back in the early 90s in Colorado, right? Like this, um, this movement has not, has, has always been there. Now they have someone who actually put them in administration and execute some of these policies, right? So uh, I would imagine that those are the architects of that's refused, you know, even turning around Central American policy, which has been a long policy that has withstanded both Republican and Democratic administrations, uh, even turning that backwards has been a pretty radical step, considering that uh, it's been in place so long. Um, they're definitely taking a very aggressive anti-immigrant policy across the board and refusing to do the, rec the recognition that's due. And even the withdrawal from the refugee uh, committee within the United Nations is a sign of that as well. Um, the, the fact that um, these palm oil uh, plantations get credit for green, um, uh, get, get actually money credits for green uh, businesses is really appalling because they remove the jungle that was really green and it was really contributing to the atmosphere and producing oxygen for the atmosphere. And and then these palm oil plants only last about five years, I think. And then when they're no good anymore, they burn them, which is just amazing that they would get credit for green farming. And, but uh, the thing I never heard before was that then nothing else can grow in the soil. And I'm wondering if you have an explanation for why it destroys the soil. That's a good question. That was from um, one of our visits to an African palm plantation um, and with the church uh, in Progreso. Um, and I don't have the actual scientific reason why it works, but the, the nutrients that are used to grow the African palm um, the, the amount of nutrients that are removed from the soil and, and that growing out of the palm uh, leaves it pretty unusable for a very long time, very sterile for a very long time. That's the explanation I was given to. So, so yes, and I won't just blame the U.S., but the World Bank as well for that one, for that policy. Can you tell us what the name of your organization is? How many people you have here? Sure. What are you collecting money? Are you having fundraisers? What do you do when you go down there? You talk to the church and the other organizations that are working for change? Sure, so La Voz de los Abajo uh, has been here for a couple of decades now. Uh, what, what, what's it called? La Voz de los Abajo, the voice of those below. The voice of the below. Is that the website? And that's the website too. I, the short, the fact, quickest way to get there is uh, search Honduras Resists. And from that blog, you'll see the links to everywhere, Honduras Resists. Um, and then uh, we actually have fundraisers, um, but I think our, our, our main purpose is to support the delegation so that the more, pe the more people that join a delegation going to Honduras and see firsthand and are able to report back and, and make connections between both sides, not just for charity, but actually around the activism and around the issues. Um, they're just as excited about to hear about the issues here in Chicago, uh, whether it's privatization, whether uh, we took a group of Southside youth uh, that were working towards uh, obtaining the trauma center over at U of Chicago. Um, so it was kind of cool because they're African American youth. They go down to the Afro Honduran community and they have so much in common in terms of uh, just culturally, but also uh, 
it's funny for the youth here to see that there's entire middle schools in the Afro Honduran community that that shut down because the students go protest, right? And like imagine if we had middle schools in Chicago shutting down so the students go protest on issues that matter for their community, right? So it's uh, it was just an in interesting exchange. Um, we've also worked with the first Afro Honduran clinic for for women and for the community. Um, in you know, 400 years of existence, the afro honduran community in, in Honduras has not had their own health clinic. Uh, they've had to travel many hours to get to a government clinic. Uh, and there's a doctor who actually learned through the international medical program at Cuba, became a doctor, returned, set up a clinic, and, uh, and currently we're supporting that clinic as well. So for the students to go down there and actually like build the clinic, <laughs> brick by brick as well as seeing it in action and seeing that a community can, uh, you know, uh, through self-determination, create their own, you know, so bring, come, bring together resources and create their own solutions. The clinic is so good that people that are not afro honduran are avoiding going to the government clinic so they can go to their clinic because they know that they'll receive a holistic health healthcare um, that looks at the whole picture and not just treating them and getting them out of it. Is there a Honduran community in Chicago? Yes, there's actually one. Uh, so the Honduran community is called, the uh, African Honduran community is called Garifuna. And they actually carry more in common with, across the border with their Belize counterparts of their community than they do with the rest, culturally, with the rest of Honduras. Uh, so there is a Belizean and Garifuna um, restaurant on the south side. So it's very, very tiny, very tiny. The links are at the July program for your college. Right. We got we got a lot of the links updated on the site. Oh, the links on the site. Okay, uh, yeah. the links are on the website. Yeah. Um, a little off the Honduran issue. I noticed you. Are you running Linux on your laptop right yes. now? <laughs> what flavor of Linux and why do you use it? Just curious. I like Ubuntu myself. <laughs> it's a version of Ubuntu. <laughs> Which one? Uh, it's a non-public version. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. I, I just, I just, I just is curious. So my uh, personal background, I'm a technical, I was a teacher, but also a computer teacher, a networking uh -huh. teacher, a math teacher, a science teacher, so I, I work in technology. And uh, so I help make, maintain the Honduras website as well as the one for the clinic. Uh, and just wherever I can be of help technically, we take laptops. Um, we took tablets down there in the past in order to, um, the church and uh, another community had a campaign where they'd go through uh, the neighborhoods and they would do a popular education module. And, Imagine you go out to you know a community and you ask them, okay, should the resources of the community be used for the majority or for the minority? Right? What are most people going to answer? <laughs> right? um, but it's such a foreign idea to us here. Um, and so with the tablets, they would do these surveys and then build you know build more knowledge and education and campaigns. Um, so that was a really great project to be able to work on, where we can send the resources from here and actually grow the knowledge base and activism down there. One more question back there. Okay. okay. The, the drug war, um, of course, is driven by this country. But, uh, next well, uh, most of the country down to Panama continue to uh, some sort of crisis mode. Excuse me. Here we go. Most of the country is all the way down to Panama continue in crisis mode? Yes. Because, uh, and I mean, I attributed. Right, I mean, I think our, uh, the explanation that, that we're offering in, is that you know the economic policies that have taken place to use the resources of all of those countries for private transnational corporations with little benefit towards the people. For example, and just going back to Honduras, um, the coast of the Afro-Honduran uh, of the, the northern coast of Honduras is in the Afro-Honduran community. They've lived there for 400 years. Um, there is a set of developers coming in that want to turn that into the next Cancun, right? So you heard of Rotan and cruises to Rotan and vacations to Rotan, which is an island off the coast. Well, they want to create, expand that all the way to the northern coast in Tela and other communities. Um, and they are you know, using extreme pressure, military pressure to silence any opposition voices to that development project. Is that development project going to yield a benefit to the afro honduran community there? No, they're going to be the suitcase carriers and the dishwashers and etc. Uh, meanwhile, the elites are cutting the deal. They're cutting the deal, and the finances are are you know, going to benefit from that development, right? So those kind of continuing projects, the privatization of the electro dams, the displacement of people, have continued the crisis. Okay. Okay. 
the guys who know that live in Colombia, uh, they they are uh, um, sitting on a mountain of gold. And my geography is very bad. Uh, are they close to the Garifuna in uh, Honduras? And um, uh, what effect is the uh, is it the Tinto Moro uh, Mining Company, the Tinto something Mining Company? Uh, are they involved with this uh, plan to uh, uh, develop a uh, tourism thing around there? Good question. I'm not sure if that company is exactly. I don't know about the ties with Colombia. Vicky, who as part of the organization has worked for a long time in Colombia as well. Oh. I could ask her, yeah, find out. I would like to know, if you were all of a sudden able to become president of Honduras, what do you think would be the best way forward, you know, or what policies do you think might be the best way forward to uh, bring Honduras solving it, some of its problems? I think uh, the route that they were heading, uh, the movement and President Zelaya was to form a, a new constitution and that constitutional mm -hmm. assembly form a constitution that would guarantee some of these equitable rights, especially mm -hmm. around land. Uh, Honduras is still a largely campesino community. Okay. Uh, growing up in Mexico, um, when Mexico was before, prior to NAFTA, uh, Mexico was primarily a, a self-sustaining, mm -hmm. not self-sustaining, but just growing sustainable agriculture for small families. Now you have 88% of the agriculture done for export, right? Um, Honduras is still in that, that phase of uh, where agrarian reform could really make a difference. Mm -hmm. Well, Mexico too, but it's much farther away from that. Uh, where agrarian reform could really make a difference to the majority of, of Honduran Campesino families. Agrarian reform, you mean like land titles, that kind of thing? Land titles, yeah. There's, and just resolving the cases that exist now would change a, a lot. They're already in court. They've been sitting there for years. The corruption prevents them from being completed because a large landowner keeps putting money in to some politician to delay them, to delay them, to delay them because they don't want to face the loss of their land, even if it's unused. Because once they allow one victory, okay. then they feel that they'll, they'll lose control. This might, might, I mean, my Any more questions? Yeah, I have a question. Okay. Do you see any possibility of a revolution in there, down there? Um, the Honduran people, the movements that we've talked to have said you know, they, they don't want a violent revolution, right? They've, se they've seen the experience of El Salvador, they've seen the experience of Guatemala. Um, they have the majority of the people support for change. They've gone through the electoral process and lost. So the next steps really are, are, are critical, uh, especially, yeah, especially with the youth, right? So, um, it, it always seems like it's, you know, just one trigger point away from something crazy happening. Um, with that kind of pressure, with that kind of repression, you, you never know what's needed. But so far, the Honduran people have been committed to a peaceful movement for, for change, and a peaceful revolution. Uh, I, uh, one, at least one person here is very ignorant. So what is Campesino? Oh, Define sorry. that. Campesino is farm, farmer. 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 Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Thank you. Is that a landowner farmer or a worker? A, worker. Uh, a laborer on a farm. Sometimes they can have their own little plot for their family, but they usually not. Oh. You touched it briefly, but how many families do you think constitute the uh, Honduran oligarchy? The Honduran oligarchy is uh, seven families. How many? Seven. Seven large families. Seven large families that owns the majority of the land, like you said before. <coughs> but the entire oligarch, constituting the top, very top, it's a hundred. Families. Well, According to my, I don't yeah. have a laptop here. Yeah, depending where you want to cut off. Yeah. Yeah. Change your water. They're still in existence. They took, uh, you know, there was initial controversy around, uh, you know, they they were taking a stand against the uh, electoral results of fraud that occurred but then it kind of withered away. Um, 
So there is an alternative to the Organization of American States where the rest of the Latin, Latin American countries, are, except the United States, are meeting. Um, but the OAS has generally been in line with whatever the United States has put out as policy. Put, uh, conform to the United States poli foreign policy in the region. In, in, in effect, they have. In effect, they would have no power if the United States didn't agree to it. So they, they, they have not challenged the United States in terms of their policies. Why don't the United States cooperate with the rest of the states in OAS? That's, that's a good question. <laughs> That's a good question. Yes. If, it, if the United States and the OAS were to take out, a, you know, to form a policy that would help the asylum seekers, that would help alleviate the crime, that would not support a coup or fraudulent results in the election, then yes, we would have a more equitable scenario where people would not be fleeing their homes, right? But the, so far, the policy has been for the United States to support these elites in and this neoliberal economic policy against, and, and with, with all these security flaws, with all these secure insecurities that are produced, and the OAS backs them up. They have not been an avenue through which the, whether it's Hondurans after the coup, or uh, Mexican mothers who have their kids kidnapped, when they go to the OAS, the OAS will not resolve them. You know, you mentioned like 12 million people needing help. You know, I, I can't see the United States saying, oh, okay, come on, come on in, we'll, all, we'll take care of all of you. Right, right, right. You know, I mean, that's why all of, all of us, all of the countries need to help these people, I, not just the U.S. Ideally, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. But, so, yes. ideally, ideally, yes, we would have... Uh, well, I, I don't know what the what the capacity would be for supporting asylum seekers or not. That's one question, right? Um, the other question is, you know, I don't know that I necessarily agree that we can't support 12 million or however many, but I think that the bigger issue is why are these people seeking asylum? And and what we keep going back and saying is that the increase in asylum seekers has taken place since the coup, and that coup was supported by the United States, Hillary Clinton as Secretary of State. The next fraud, the next fraudulent election that happened was supported by the United States. The next one that happened was supported by the United States. If we can get the United States to not interfere and allow, not support the elites in their fraudulent and corrupt ways, then we can have a more equitable society where people would not be fleeing. We would not have 12 million signs. Okay. You mentioned uh, a movement called Zapata. Is that a new movement? With an old name or the same name? The same. Uh, it's what? It's already 30 years old. <laughs> so it's the newer movement with the same name. With the old name. The old name. And uh, the idea is basically the same, uh, helping uh, the poor, uh, returning their land. Yes. One of the main idea. Yes. Uh, all right. I would like to know if you're familiar with the work of Hernando de Soto and his movement in Peru called the Institute for Liberty and Democracy. And if not, um, I'd like to, I'll, I'll talk to you, talk about it in a rebuttal period. Okay. That would be great. Yeah, I've, I've heard about it, but I can't say I'm dead. I don't want to speak to something I'm not dead on. Okay. Okay. Um, any other questions, anybody? We have one more over here. I'm sorry. Well, is is uh, Art Chappell still running the drug trade from his jail cell? I mean, if he got out of jail, but like that, you know, but that was in Mexico. That's a, that's a good question. I don't know. That's what they I think uh, the influence of Art Chappell has definitely waned. Um, the, the, the set of new cartels that have arisen in his absence, and this is going back to Mexico. Um, there's definitely a new wave, a new generation of cartels, actually called new generation cartels. Um, the power, the, uh, but whoever the cartels are, the formula is the same. Pay off politicians. Those politicians are also supported by the United States through foreign aid and military funding, and the drug, drug war money, drug war, the Alliance for Prosperity, and all these different programs that are out of the State Department that continue to provide 
funding for uh, both the Mexican government, the Honduran government, et cetera, to carry out these wars, but these governments are no different than the cartels themselves. So, um, whoever it might be, whether it's a trap war or anyone else, the formula for the drug war continues to be the same. All right. Last question? Can I ask a couple questions? <laughs> yeah. Um, I didn't know if it was, uh, you talked about it earlier. Um, what influence does the U.S. military operations have in those countries you're talking about? Would, there, uh, would, they, would they be better off if we withdrew our troops? But you, the U.S. maintains the military base in Honduras still. Uh, when they grabbed the president out of the presidential palace in his pajamas and put him on a plane, that plane stopped at the United States military base before leaving the country. So what role did the United States play if the plane that was carrying out the coup stopped on US, at a U.S. base on the way out? Uh, and the U.S. and Hillary and everyone else was trying to claim that they didn't understand what was going on. But then Hillary later in her book justifies the fact that the coup occurred, right? So it's after the fact we learned that there was that role. Uh, yes, the military, uh, the military support, um, in, in U.S. military support, Israeli military support continues to exist in Honduras uh, under these, you know, security, anti-terrorist, anti-drug um, programs. They're basically supporting the billionaire predators that are running your country. Exactly. Yeah. Hey, I've got a question. Uh, aren't, aren't you, you know, Hillary Clinton did this terrible thing. Uh, you know, aren't you glad we've got Donald Trump as president? Because I'm sure that he will never interfere in, right. in the affairs of other countries. <laughs> Funny, right? <laughs> Crush it over there. And they have some On the other hand, you know what? If we're going to give out all this military aid and financial aid to these countries, shouldn't we um, administer the money and make sure there's less corruption? Not just Honduras or Mexico, but everywhere. If the UN and other countries are going to be given foreign aid, maybe they would, all these corrupt countries, maybe we should have more legal, uh, you know, footprint there. Yep, yep. Uh, and that's what the Berta Caceres law tries to do. It says, well, human rights maintain have to be maintained at a certain level before aid is released. Right. So those stipulations to aid, uh, the State Department says, well, there's already an improvement in, you know, in human rights. We don't have to have any law around this, right? But as we can see, the assassinations continue. Right. And this policy, I mean, most of you have been around since the 80s, right? I mean, right. the 80s, this policy, well, this was Elliot Abrams, right, in El Salvador, uh, saying, oh, human rights in El Salvador is increasing after the El Masota massacre of a thousand civilians, in the, in, right? So, and Elliot Abrams is still running around on Fox News talking crap. So, those policies, yes, would make sense. And yes, there's a law, and there's representatives and senators who are pushing for that law, but the State Department continues to maintain that they don't need that in order to administer funds. Big NATO forces in all these countries that are corrupt. Yep. Or NATO forces that are at least maintain law. All right. All right. Any other questions? Okay. Well, listen, I know you don't have the answer to this, but take a guess. How much compensation or extraneous push did Guatemala receive in order to transfer their embassy to Jerusalem? Israel? I mean, oh, Guatemala. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we don't know. Yeah, that's a. We don't know. I knew you. <laughs> okay. Is there any more questions? Otherwise, let's go. Did Guatemala do it too? Yes. Oh, you, oh, Guatemala moved to Jerusalem. Okay, I didn't. I didn't. Okay. You need to wind it up. All right. We want to get oh, yeah. Let's see. Let's see. All right. All right. All right. I have to leave for another commitment in 15 minutes, but I'll watch the rebuttal for a little bit. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Please. Appreciate it. Thank you for coming. Yeah. You can stick around and get the last okay. word. Let's have an, an estimate of. Can hear you. Who wants to give a rebuttal or not? Is this thing working? Yeah, it's working. Okay. Uh, well, he. Uh, this is a poem I wrote a couple of months ago. Draining the swamp. Oh boy. 
<clears throat> Mr. Trump has talked about draining the swamp. Yeah. It it's is. come clear to me that I agree with Mr. Trump. And I agree with what he says. Yes, there's a swamp in Washington that is, prevents passing of legislation needed in our own and our nation's own health. Legislation now being passed is being short-sighted and will harm us and America's own future, as well as America's Central American futures. The problem is we need to have a clear picture of what and where the swamp is. The swamp is a swamp of money, a swamp of debt. We will all have to pay for this. And where is most of that money going? Not to you or me or future generations, but only to a few at the top. Look to those who support the swamp with their votes. These people need to be drained out of the Congress with your vote. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Uh, the United States has been an imperial power, that is a modern imperial power, since the Spanish-American War in 1898. Okay, give me a minute. And they took over Cuba, the Philippines, and the Dominican Republic, and a whole bunch of places in that area. And the other day, I was watching CNN at 9 o'clock, I think it was Sunday night, and they had on a travel, so-called travelogue about Hawaii. And usually, if you see a travelogue about Hawaii, it's usually the beautiful seaside with the high rises and people living very comfortably, and and it's a, it's more or less a paradise. But they showed something else. It was a black fellow. His last name was Bell, with a beard. And what he done, he went to the natives of Hawaii and started interviewing them. And the first thing they said, we don't want to be part of the United States. We don't want to be a colony of the United States. We want to rule ourselves, grow our, our own food, and take care of our own government. And afterwards, what they showed was how so-called natives of Hawaii live. And they live in shanty towns. And the shanty towns are built of cardboard, pieces of metal they could get, and more or less like somebody that is homeless in Chicago would live. And, and this, this is more or less a sample of how people live in Latin America for the most part. Yeah. I'm not talking about the millionaires or the billionaires, I'm talking about ordinary people Thank you, sir. in very, very Thank you, sir. primitive Thank you, sir. and rundown conditions, and they just get by from day to day. In the United States, has maybe invaded about 100 countries during the uh, 20th century, not by itself, but through surrogates. And if you look at Chile, you look at Brazil, you look at Venezuela or, or Bolivia, places like that, they're trying to free themselves from the yoke of American imperialism. And that's their biggest problem. They can't really live in this type of environment. They don't get no health care. They don't get anything. They have to fend for themselves. Luckily, in Hawaii, I don't know, they could do fishing and, they, and have something to eat. But uh, I don't believe that, the, that most of these countries are going to free themselves in the short period. What I think is going to happen is we're going to have the biggest depression that any country has ever seen in the next depression. And with that basis, people have to have the uh, organization 
to get rid of imperialism and live a decent life. But the way it is now, it's getting worse and worse. And there are, so it's, it was, in the Spanish-American War was Philippines, Puerto Rico, and Cuba at least. And he mentioned Hawaii at the same time. Uh, as the presidents went on, that was McKinley, and then, of course, we had Roosevelt. When Teddy Roosevelt was in, he noticed that uh, Cuba didn't want to work on the, on the uh, canal, the Panama Canal, so he sent a gunboat down there, I think uh, maybe a bigger uh, ship, and, uh, and uh, I mean, uh, uh, Colombia was broken up into Panama and Colombia. Of course, after that, we had Woodrow Wilson, that great Democratic guy. Well, he uh, had us invade numerous countries in Central and South America, as I recall. And if you want to read about that, get James Lowen, Lies My Teacher Told Me, Revised Edition 2007, and the first chapter talks about a wonderful president we had in Woodrow Wilson. So I hope others add to this uh, commentary. Uh, as far as I know, Sid was right. It seemed to start with uh, around the time of the Spanish American War that we went into imperialism. Thank you. The last two rebutters uh, yes. really um, knew a lot about the history of American imperialism, imperialism there in Central America. Uh, it's a sad uh, state of events. I, uh, I was in a march earlier today um, where we were protesting one of the issues we were talking about, about the uh, kids having been uh, kidnapped, basically, by Do Donald Trump and his, uh, his ICE uh, hooligans or gangsters or whatever you want to call them. Nazis. Nazis. That's a good word. Yeah, I think we've used that word. Um, but, um, um, yeah, it's, it's, I just want to reaffirm um, that, uh, uh, I'm glad that the um, polls have shown that uh, people did finally care about this issue uh, after Trump seemingly went uh, too far. Um, but, uh, and of course, you know, people are hurt. And uh, many of these children may not be returned to their, um, to their parents because, uh, uh, well, who loses 3,000 children or, you know, <laughs> Or should we quibble about a few hundred then, here and there? Huh? But, um, Trump's number one. <laughs> he's, uh, he's really, you know, uh, we've had some bad presidents who have committed a lot of crimes. Um, and you can go with, you know, Jackson.